welcome to your region this week. I'm Anandi Carol Woolery. Rogers TV held their annual 12-hour kickback marathon in support of mental health awareness. We were there with the host on why this is such an important event. My friend Aiden Grummet, um, he approached me and said, you know what, I'd really, I feel like there's a big need um, to really encourage people to speak out and just uh, share what they're going through around, like, around their mental health and just share. And he felt like there wasn't enough being done. And he said, what, what can we do? Maybe we can work on something together. So we, we thought and we thought and we came together and we said, uh, why don't we do this? And then we approached uh, Patty from Rogers and we said, would you do a 12? our live marathon all to do with mental health and she said yes and so now here we are three years down the road and it's been it's been a fantastic journey and it's been amazing the conversations that have come out of this and the conversations that have been encouraged because of all of the incredible guests that we have and the hosts and all of the awesome people at Rogers that have really kind of helped build that snowball. Up until the moment we were sitting on set the first year I didn't realize what we were getting ourselves into. Um, it was an anxiety-inducing day for me the first year. Um, the next year or the next day, I basically had my phone shut off because I was getting so many messages. I didn't realize the impact that we created by it. Um, the second year was a lot easier for me to deal with. There were a lot of really good things that came out of it for our community. And by this year, I think that we've got everything down pat. I'm a lot more relaxed. And uh, it's amazing to have all across Canada now watching, to have a lot more of the, uh, the Rogers staff from the Kitchener uh, location here to help us out. I think everything's running like a well-oiled machine now, so I'm really glad to have everyone on board. It's been, it's done exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to con like start that conversation and have it continue to move on and really have that snowball effect so that the more people that we affect and the more people, like just by having a guest come on the show and talking to them and having them open up about what they're going through, that led to all of their friends and family seeing that and being able to share that. Like social media is so incredibly powerful um, to be able to to like, increase the message that we're trying to achieve here, which is having everybody feel comfortable with with speaking out about what they're going through and what they are actually feeling. And I mean, you ask anybody, how are you feeling today? Oh, fine, good. But are they really ever like feeling just fine or good? They're either feeling way better than that and they're just saying that or they're feeling much worse than that and they just don't feel comfortable to open up and, and to share. For me, um, honestly, if one person was suffering in silence and there to open up and um, seek out the help that they want or that they deserve and they need that would be the biggest thing for me anything else um, is above and beyond uh, so for viewers at home with kickback I just encourage you to watch and enjoy um, look through all of the different topics that we have covered um, and if you're if you are feeling something or you're struggling with something make sure you find somebody to reach out to and chat with and if somebody doesn't uh, have like a good response that first time continue to don't shut down continue to seek out somebody that will will listen and will hear you out Crime Stoppers Guelph Wellington raised their flag at Guelph City Hall to recognize Crime Stoppers Month. Guelph producer Jan Hamilton was there capturing the moment. Today was our Crime Stoppers Month 2020 flag raising here in the city of Guelph. Uh, we were able to go out front of City Hall and have all of our community representatives join us and uh, hoist the Crime Stoppers flag. Crime Stoppers Month, does it have a theme in particular? The theme for 2020 for Crime Stoppers Month is creating partnerships against crime, which is why it's so perfect that we had so many of our partners come out to the flag raising today. We're very proud of our partnerships, and Crime Stoppers Guelph Wellington is one of the uh, leaders in partnerships with other community members. We're doing things that haven't been done before, whether it's event partnering or just uh, programming partnering. Talk about your community partners. Oh, we have everyone from Guelph Police Service, Guelph Fire Service, uh, the City of Guelph, Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis, uh, Victim Services, just to name a few, uh, and some media partners as well, including Rogers, to be able to come out and, and demonstrate the support of the partnership that we have. So why is this so important to the work that you do? Well, I think what Crime Stoppers does is it's another way for members of our community, if they want to provide information in relation to something, but for some reason don't want to call the police, Crime Stoppers is a, is a confidential and an anonymous way that they can provide this information and then Crime Stoppers can forward it to us. Dave, I think a lot of people would expect 
a partnership between police service and Crime Stoppers. But what's the connection with the fire department? Well, there's a uh, very big connection with the fire department. The fire department's mission is community safety. Um, that's something that we are pride ourselves on and something that we really want to contribute to. Um, the other piece is there are natural fires that happen, there are accidental fires that happen, but there are also sometimes ones that are deliberate. And those deliberate ones are ones that are a crime. And fire department very much supports the idea of information being able to get to the police service to be able to solve something to make the community a safer place. Other than reporting tips, are there ways people can get involved and help out? Absolutely, we are so interested in having people volunteer and there's two ways you can do that. You can uh, apply to be an event volunteer, so come out for one event at a time throughout the year. Or you could apply to be a member of our board of directors. That's a m little more commitment, but it also helps you get more involved in Crime Stoppers. For either of these options, go to our website at csgw.tips and request information on how to be a volunteer. Your region this week will continue after this. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The GO Transit expansion to Kitchener is something that residents keep hearing about but have nothing to show for it. 570 News' Mike Farwell speaks with Waterloo NDP MPP Catherine Fife about the expansion and what seems to be the issue. Catherine Fife is an NDP MPP. She represents Waterloo and joins us to talk about it. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you very much for making the time for us. I know it's a busy day for you with a news conference coming up in a little bit. We'll talk about that too. But on the issue of P3 procurement, uh, is this a model that works in the province? Well, I do want to say, I mean, we, we do know from the Auditor General that uh, there are some problems with, with uh, public-private partnerships. In 2014, the Auditor General's report show that the province's use of P3s on hospitals and transit projects cost the province $8 billion more than if they had used traditional public financing. And uh, we do know that uh, this essentially happens because private contractors face higher borrowing costs than government, and government can borrow money for these large-scale capital projects at a much lower rate. And that's, that's one that's going to hit so close to home for us. So how concerned should we be that this timeline either gets pushed out or disappears entirely and we don't get the service at all? Well, I mean, I think that there's definitely, uh, there's definitely a serious concern because, you know, this, this community has been promised so many advancements on GO Train. You'll remember the Liberals promised us the bullet train. They promised us every 15 minutes. They promised us high-speed rail. And, and Waterloo Region, in comparison to other jurisdictions across the province, sees, um, sees much fewer uh, you know, train rides, uh, peak and off-peak as well. And the original business case stated that two-way all-day go would be delivered by 2025, which was one year off the broken Liberal promise. And now, uh, now that Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinx can't come to an understanding as to who's going to accept the third stage of this uh, project, this, this really puts us um, at a disadvantage, both economically and from a, a commuter you know, lifestyle perspective as well. What would you see, Catherine, as the impacts of not having that service that we have so long been promised? Well, so even the even the promise. I mean, I've been pushing to actually have at least the, the kind of service that the Lakeshore Line has. The the plan that was has been proposed would cost one billion dollars. On weekdays, it would have peak two trains per hour and off peak one train per hour. Uh, this is likely the highest level of service that we could get um, because CN still owns the track between Bramley and Georgetown. And I, and you know, I commute on this train, and I can tell you that we are often delayed by freight trains, and that is why the the freight bypass, I think, was so important. But it's important for folks to know that the the level of service that we've been promised, which also included some electrification, which means that you know, in the year 2020, we should not be running diesel trains in Ontario, and so. 
having a transition uh, plan in place would would greatly impact you know the level of noise that these trains make and the efficiency of them. Uh, but this level of service is significantly lower than the rest of the GO network, which under GO expansion plan is on track for two-way all-day service every 15 minutes in core areas. And that's what our mayors have been fighting for. That's what our universities have been fighting for. And that's what biz- the businesses have made the economic case for service every 15 minutes in this region. No question on, on the financial side. I couldn't agree more. But I do wonder, Catherine, about uh, the government then being in the business of operating these systems. Is that the best use of the government's time? Well, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I think that once the project is built, um, the 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 original intention of public-private partnerships, and this was Dwight Duncan under the Liberals, was that we the government would learn and work in partnership with the private sector to become innovative and to adapt to changing technology and practices. Uh, you know, so just contracting it out and having it separate from government, even though it is being funded by government, uh, doesn't serve the population and the and the public very well. I, I think it's time for the provincial government that need uh, time that they need to take ownership over transit plans, put money on the table, ensure there is a well thought out plan, and find a responsible b- bidder to put shovels in the ground. And but but ultimately the. The government owns the project, and so it's a. This is a very interesting case with that Ben Spur has, you know, revealed. Uh, you know, MetroLink and Infrastructure Ontario uh, were forced to reconsider the procurement process for the massive expansion. Now, you know, at the end of the day, who really is driving this process? And I think that's a really good question for Caroline Mulroney, who is uh, the Minister of Transportation for Ontario. Catherine, I know you stepped out of meetings for us today. We appreciate that. We'll let you get back to it. And thank you for being with with us on the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time, Mike. Catherine Fife is the NDP MPP for Waterloo. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario is holding another one-day strike this coming Monday, which will affect the region of Waterloo. Because of these job actions, students in the Waterloo region will not be receiving report cards for Term 1. The board recommends speaking with your child's teacher for information on your students' grades. The City of Cambridge has received a recommendation to demolish the abandoned Preston Springs Hotel on Fountain Street. It has been deemed unsafe and would require an astronomical amount of money to have it made structurally sound. The money would not guarantee that the hotel could even be brought up to code. And Carlton Card stores throughout the region are slated to close within weeks after the parent company announced that the physical stores would be closing across North America, including 76 Canadian locations. Online sales of the cards will continue, as the manufacturings of the cards are done by a separate company. Your region this week will continue right after these messages. Welcome back. 519 Sports Online covers the Women's Hockey Dream Gap Tour in Waterloo. Let's take a look. Laura McIntosh is a Waterloo native who is a former NCAA star. She is the all-time leading scorer in the history of Ohio State University with 170 career points. Meanwhile, Lauren Gable is a Kitchener native who played NCAA hockey at Clarkson University. In her senior season, Gable was named the top player in NCAA women's hockey. Local dignitaries on hand for the ceremonial puck drop at the PWHPA contest. Dave Jaworski, Angela Veith, and Catherine Fife 
all in attendance to the game, and it's Team McIntosh striking first. The puck goes to Natalie Spooner in front, and she buries it. That was the start of a big day for Spooner. 1-0 Team McIntosh after one. During the first intermission, it was the Waterloo Ravens hitting the ice for a mini game. Over 20 young novice players taking part, showing off their outstanding skills. Second period now, it's another goal for Natalie Spooner. She's at the point and she rips it in. That's a power play marker. Spooner has a pair, 2-0 McIntosh. Back comes Team Gable. Brianne Jenner with a steal down low and she sets up Jamie Lee Ratray. Team Gable closing the gap, it's 2-1. A few minutes later, Team Gable gets the equalizer. Kelly Gribbons over to Jocelyn the Rock. She buries it. LaRock getting Gable back on even terms. It's 2-2. Two, two. Final minute of the period now. Here comes Taylor Woods. She is racing in and goes upstairs for the goal. Team McIntosh with a 3-2 lead after 40 minutes. Let's go to the third. Natalie Spooner grabs the puck at center. She's got a break and she's got a goal. Spooner with her third of the day. It's a hat trick. 4-2 McIntosh. Back the other way. Team Gable is pressing and it's Lauren Gable getting the goal. She roofs that rebound. We've got a one goal game and some young Lorne Gable fans liking what they see. Later, Team Gable on the power play. The pass over to Jocelyn LaRock and she ties the game. LaRock with her second marker of the day. It's 4-4 with five minutes left on the clock. Back comes McIntosh and a terrific solo effort from Sarah Nurse. She comes in and scores, putting Team McIntosh back on top. Nurse makes it 5-4. Then watch the near point. Renata Fast with a rocket. She scores on the power play and puts the game out of reach. Team McIntosh winning a very entertaining game. 7-4 over Team Gable in front of a big crowd at the Waterloo Rec Complex. Talks between the region and Unifor broke down earlier this week over on-the-job safety of Grand River Transit drivers. Your Region This Week producer, Robert Kubinga, has the details. This is a strike update as of Thursday, January 23rd. Talks between Unifor 4304, representing Grand River Transit drivers and the region of Waterloo, have broken down. The strike began when the deal formed by the bargaining teams was turned down by union members, causing the strike to begin on January 21st. The strike affects Grand River Transit buses, Bus Plus, Mobility Plus, the Ainsley Street Bus Terminal, and the Customer Service Center at King & Frederick in Kitchener. Wednesday evening, a busload of Unifor members can be seen disembarking in front of the regional headquarters on Frederick Street, joining their fellow union members on the picket lines. This is the first strike in the 40-plus year history of the region of Waterloo. Mike Murray, CAO, of the region of Waterloo spoke with Brandon Graziano on Kitchener today about the strike on January 21st. Here's a piece of what he had to say. Um, one of the things that, um, that, that uh, the members were looking for, our employees were looking for, um, was barriers. Um, some of them feel that um, they would be safer if there were barriers around uh, the operator area on a bus. Uh, so, oh, over a week ago, um, we agreed that we would install safety barriers on all of our buses over the next three years, over the three-year term of this agreement. The cost that's um, something like $1.7 million, um, but we've agreed to do that. Um, you know, they've raised it as a safety issue. We take safety seriously, uh, so we've agreed to do that. Uh, another issue that does come up is um, we have cameras on all of our buses, and the cameras are there both to ensure the safety of our operators and to ensure the safety of our customers. Unifor released a statement on Wednesday after talks broke down. We can't bargain with ourselves. It will take movement from the employer to reach a fair deal that responds to the issues driving this dispute. Transit workers have difficult jobs and are seeking respect and fairness from our employer, said Tim Jewell, Unifor Local 4304 President. For your region this week, I'm Robert Kabinga. Your region this week continues after the break.
Welcome back. Sean Frafaro has the highlights of the Guelph Storm and Kitchener Rangers over the past week. Both the Kitchener Rangers and the Guelph Storm had a three in three weekend. Friday night it was North Bay in at the odd. The Rangers would get off to a hot start. Francesco Pinelli's 14th of the year made it one nothing. Liam Howell after that would make it two nothing and Greg Morales shorthanded three nothing after one into the second period. Greg Morales again scores his 20th. Riley Damiani scores and the Rangers are up 5-0. Luke Moncada would break the shutout bid for Lucas File, but Riley Damiani restores the five goal lead, making it 6-1. And Declan McDonald with his first of two goals. Into the third, here is the second from Declan McDonald as the Rangers go up 8-1. Axel Bergfist scores the ninth for the Rangers right here top shelf. And with 12 seconds left, Josh Curry would make that a seven goal lead, 9-2 is the final. Guelph would welcome Owen Sound on Friday night and this one was all Owen Sound. In the first period, Caleb Pearson opens the scoring with his 16th of the year. Barrett Kerwin would make it 2-0 at the end of one period. In the second, Matthew Struthers back with the attack. Adam McMaster makes it 4-0. The Storm would answer back, but too little, too late. Late in the third period, Cooper Walker makes it 4-1. That is the final. Kitchener and Guelph would have a home and home against each other to close out the weekend on Saturday. It was at the Sleeman Center and the Rangers would open the scoring as former Guelph Storm Liam Howell gets his 12th of the year up 1-0. Mike Batesian continues his hot streak. The Rangers are up 2-0. Danny Zilkin would answer back for the Guelph Storm. Still in the first period, it's 2-1. Greg Morellis, red hot as of late, gets his 21st. They're up 3-1. Eric Yuba scores near the end of the period to make it 3-2. Into the second, Declan McDonald scores his 11th. The Rangers are up 4-2. Pavel Gogolev would answer back here on the power play, his 32nd goal of the year, 4-3. The Rangers are up, but Jonathan Yantis tucks in his 31st. And in the third, Greg Morales with his second of the game and 22nd on the year. That is your final. On Sunday, these two teams would meet again in Kitchener, and this was all Guelph in the first period. Andre Bakanov with his eighth, Eric Yuba with his 16th, and Cam Hillis with his 16th. 16 to three, the shots in the first period for the Storm, but Mike Patizian continues his point streak to seven games with his 12th of the year, and Isaac Langdon gets his fourth of the year. It's 3-2 after two. Into the third, the turnover from Riley Damiani. Eric Yuba scores his 17th, but Arbor Jackeye scores his fourth of the year. It's 4-3 now. The comeback is afoot. Isaac Langdon then ties the game up in the third period. And with under four minutes to play, Riley Damiani scores the game-winning goal. Upcoming games for these teams. Kitchener will play twice on the weekend. For the Storm, it's another three-in-three three weekend. And then on Thursday, they head all the way up to North Bay to take on the battalion. That's it for another episode of Your Region This Week. For more information on the show, or if you have a story idea, visit our website, rogerstv.com, and fill out our proposal form at the bottom. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.